Good morning. It's Reverend Mike Caper from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Um, our text for this morning is 2 Corinthians 13, 1 through 14. I'm going to dive right in. This will be my third visit to you, writes Paul to the church in Corinth. Every matter must be established by a testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not be lenient with those who sinned earlier or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not in weak. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him through our dealing with you. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong so that the people will see that we have stood the test so that you will do what is right even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth but only for the truth. This is why I write these things when I am absent that when I come I may not have to be too harsh with my use of authority the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice! Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This ends our reading. Well, my friends, the Bible is a big book covering a lot of ground. My experience is that you have to pick some doorway in, something to focus on. So we've spent a couple of months using the cross as our focal point, and specifically how Paul speaks about the cross in his letters. And now in this last chapter of 2 Corinthians, we look at our final text. The back and forth between Paul and the church in the city of Corinth in Greece shows they had a stormy relationship way back then in the first century. We only have Paul's half of the correspondence. We don't know what sort of letters they wrote to him, but it sounds like they were painful, containing a lot of personal attacks that he felt he had to defend himself against. In between some of the letters, Paul visited Corinth, and in this last chapter, he's planning his third visit. Now, when I think about how to summarize what Paul says to the Corinthians, some phrases occur to me, things like, grow up, <laughs> straighten up and fly right, get with the plan. Right? There's kind of a parental tone. And in, in verse two, he says, when he gets there, he will, he will not spare them a good talking to. <laughs> Despite that, he is not telling them what to think. Instead, he tells them to, quote, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? This is good advice. We Christians ought to regularly examine our lives to see how we're doing in our faith. For most people, most of the time, this is routine and should lead to small course corrections, not huge vacillations. In fact, huge vacillations may be a sign of concern. If you find yourself swinging between feeling utterly bereft and unlovable on the one hand and supremely confident and full of yourself on the other, Something may not be quite right. It might be time to seek out a, a pastor or a therapist. And, of course, once in a while, perhaps God's Spirit will prompt you to make a major change in your life, one that will upend the status quo. If your conscience is bugging you to do that, then you probably ought to listen and take action. But for this sermon, I am going to speak about the more mundane exercise of examining one's Christian walk. It's a good habit to be in, something akin to regular oil changes for your car. 
not hard to do, not too exciting, but you better do it or things might seize up and stall out. Let's reflect a little on how you do such an examination. I can give you a few tips, but I won't go too far for reasons I'll explain later. First, here are some outward signs, things we can, concrete things we can look at. Are you going to worship regularly with a community of faith? In my opinion, that is the foundation of it all. If you aren't doing that, then you are likely in trouble. No one can do this Christian stuff alone. Second, are you engaging in some kind of devotion at home? Are you reading the Bible? Maybe you use a resource like the Daily Bread, or maybe you just pick up the Bible and read a chapter. If you're looking to get started, start with the Gospel of Matthew. Are you praying? In the morning, before meals, and before bed are some favorite times. Do you occasionally talk about matters of faith with your family or friends or perhaps a prayer group like the ones we have on monday or wednesday uh new people always welcome just get in touch with me these are concrete activities that we believe will have an impact as you follow through with them they will lead to inward signs to look for in the life of faith and that's what we're going to talk about now i'm going to summarize these by calling this becoming soft-hearted. Perhaps you remember Old Testament passages where people had hard hearts. This is the opposite. What do I mean by soft hearts? Well, actually some, some people in my congregation talk about this regularly, especially uh, in the Thursday group where we're working on the life of faith together. One person reports they used to be more short-tempered and that through this church, God is teaching them how to love. Another gives thanks for more patience in dealing with difficult people. Another gratefully reflects on a lifetime of faith and how it has brought them through many trials. And common to us all is a hunger to learn more from God's word and the wisdom of those who have come before us in the faith. Let's get back to Paul. At many places in his writings, Paul gives lists of the sort of qualities one might hope to find in a church and in church people. My favorite is Galatians 5, but I quote that too much. So here's one from 1 Corinthians 13, where he waxes about the qualities of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Hopefully, your inner examination and reflection on your Christian journey show an increase of these kinds of qualities as God's Spirit works in you. If you don't see such an increase, then maybe you go back to the outer examination and consider concrete activities you could do that might fertilize your faith. I gave you some guidelines about this, but I haven't given you a specific set of steps or anything. And that's probably a good thing. Spiritual matters are soft hard to define. There are good practices, but it's not a recipe. And frankly, when you're visiting new churches, be a little cautious about preachers who try to give you a recipe. Um, I found a great Facebook quote this week, some sentences from the Clergy Coaching Network introducing an essay. What happens when the church tells people what to think instead of how to think? What happens when religious leaders refuse to challenge congregants about their imbalanced perspectives? Jason Bradley invites us to think about how much we treat opinions as true. Mm, that's provocative, isn't it? You know, Paul certainly educates people about biblical truth and correct doctrine, but he also insists that they must examine themselves to figure out how to apply these things to their particular situation their life. And the implication is that we should be suspicious of religious leaders who are overly controlling. 
an almost absurd example would be the actual cult leader in Kenya who recently convinced his congregation to starve themselves to death so they could meet Jesus. I, on the other hand, am reminding people that we have lunch today after worship. <laughs> um, I just don't even know how to look at this thing in Kenya. It's so extreme. But you can probably think of more mundane examples where preachers tell people what to think about politics or technology or science or even innocuous habits. A, a quick rule of thumb is this. The further the preacher strays from the simplest, plainest truths of the Bible, the more you should be on your guard. But you should be equally suspicious of a person who does not deal with the modern world at all that seems completely stuck in the past. Instead, the preacher's job is to invite the congregation to consider how to deal with the current world according to the ancient biblical truths that ground us. I so appreciate that sense of grounding in my life. Without it, I would feel so unstable, blown around by every headline and whatever the crisis du jour is. And I pray that I strike the right balance when speaking to you about contemporary events. Paul would make a poor cult leader because he's always talking about the cross. Listen to verse four. Christ was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we live with him in our dealing with you. Paul doesn't only identify with the risen Christ. He is equally in touch with the Christ suffering on the cross. The object of Paul's devotion is the one who died on a cross. Paul is candid about his struggles, his pain, his own sense of weakness. To quote one of my old professors, Dr. Kauser, Paul has a strikingly positive interpretation of afflictions. No bitterness or hostility emerges. No sense of bafflement as to why this has to happen. No apparent stifling of an uncontrollable rage at the injustice of the situation. In none of the passages is an effort made to identify his persecutors or to lay blame for his trials on a particular group. While the pain and tribulations are not sought, neither are they unexpected. In fact, it is a little shocking how well Paul is able to take his troubles in stride. Isn't that a beautiful quote? Let me reiterate in my own words. Paul doesn't deny that he has struggles or afflictions, but neither does he let those difficulties become the dominant narrative of his life. This is a good reminder that Christian growth does not equate with worldly success. We do, after all, worship the Savior who died on a cross. What Christian development based on the cross says is that we will become better able to handle the crisis, the challenges, the aging, and the mortality. We'll improve in our way we can handle that. Verses 8 and 9 from our passage say, we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. And referring to the church, Paul continues that we are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayer is that you will be fully restored. As a preacher trying to honor Paul and more so our crucified Lord, I tried to live out this verse. Use well the authority the Lord gave you. It is for building up the body of Christ, not for tearing down. As a community of faith, we will all have moments of trial and weakness when we lean on others. Even the great Paul said, we are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And so I am grateful for the strength of my congregation and for my wife, a strong woman of faith, who have, will be in worship this morning with me for a change. Usually he's in her own church. Like Paul, like you, I have moments of strength and moments of weakness. And my brothers and sisters in Christ lift me up. And I, of course, notice immediately that God actually hasn't gone anywhere. He's still right there still lifting me up as well. A life of faith is like that. 
I hope that you have heard that message as you have heard some of these sermons in the series on the cross, for it is the center of our faith. And I urge you to meditate on that, my friends, and I wish you many blessings. Amen.